Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, Culture Eat Strategy for Breakfast. I just want to start off with a quote. I'm going to leave there for a, a minute. So, this might seem like an unusual quote to uh, start a presentation about cultural change in IT operations with, but hopefully I'm going to explain to you uh, how this relates to uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So, obviously we hear a lot about the benefits that are enabled by cloud. Innovation, agility, security, reliability. But there's a lot more to really getting the benefits of cloud than just signing up for the service. Along with the migration to cloud, comes the requirement for our organizations to align their business processes and the way we work with this new environment and the agility that it allows us. So we're going to talk today about some of the practical things we can do to introduce cultural change into our organizations. And to implement this change successfully, we need to understand deeply the mechanisms behind why DevOps works. It's not enough to just understand what it is. We need to be able to understand it to a level that as leaders and ambassadors in this area, we can take this back into our organizations and really demonstrate to others the benefits of working in this kind of way. So to come back to the quote, in order to do cultural change well, we need to think a little bit, about, a little bit like musicians. We need to make sure that we understand things well enough and we can communicate those things well enough that that understanding begins to be felt by others in our organizations and you know, really spread the benefits of this kind of change. So this was the first question that came into my mind when I saw the, uh, the title of this presentation. Does it? So I'm hoping to show you during the course of this that I, I really believe it does. Uh, and also, that you know, this is one of the most important things we can do when we're trying to introduce a DevOps culture into our organizations. So you'll have heard a lot of presentations today about the benefits of using AWS services and you know, how you can achieve elasticity and agility throughout your organizations. And with the huge power and flexibility that cloud affords, we have a, a huge range of options available to us in terms of being able to do things quickly. But the organizations that are really getting the most out of cloud and the most out of AWS are those organizations who can match their business processes to that agility. So just to give you a bit of an example of what I'm, what I'm talking about here, um, we're going to hear from a few customers in a, in a minute. Uh, we have the Met Office and FanDuel here. And one of the things that the Met Office have done is uh, they run a service called the National Severe Weather Warning Service. Now, I'm thinking a few of you in this room will probably have had some interactions with this. This is the service that, if you have a, a mobile app on your phone, tells you there's going to be snow tomorrow. Um, and these alerts are consumed by a number of organizations, so government, a lot of businesses, local councils, anyone who's got an interest in, in finding out about these severe weather events. Now, the thing that really interests me about this workload is it's incredibly spiky. So clearly, if it's going to snow tomorrow, the service is very busy. We're sending out a lot of alerts. A lot of people are interested in that. But on a bright, sunshiny day like today, although you wouldn't necessarily know it sat in here, uh, the service is quiet. There's no severe weather, so it's not doing a lot. So clearly, this is a great use case for AWS, right? We can afford the scalability that the service can cope with the peak load when it needs to, and we can make it so that it costs very little when it doesn't. But the thing that's enabled the Met Office to, to do this and to achieve those cost savings isn't necessarily a technical thing. The service itself is relatively simple. We use API Gateway, we use S3, we use Lambda, and we use that to deliver fairly simple, sort of, you know, a couple of lines of text alerts about what's going to happen with the weather tomorrow. But some of the key challenges around doing this are non technical challenges. So, for example, Lambda hasn't been reviewed by security. They don't understand it, they don't know what it does. It's going to take time to deal with that. Finance doesn't necessarily know how you can forecast the usage of API Gateway. You know, we don't know what severe weather events are going to be coming up over the course of the next year. So we don't know what the level of service is going to be or the level of usage of this service is going to be. So the thing that's really enabled Met Office to do that and to achieve those cost savings is having the culture that allows that experimentation and that flexibility and allows these services to be used in that kind of way. 
And when you can do that, you can really achieve some, some fantastic benefits. So my name is James Lambert. I'm a technical account manager at AWS. So I'm assuming if you're in this room, you're on the operations track, you all know about the benefits of uh, AWS and what enterprise support can bring to you and uh, your engagement with AWS. And my day-to-day -day role involves engaging with our largest customers and ensuring that they're getting the best usage out of their cloud investment. And obviously, as part of that, I see a lot of different organizational cultures. So what I want to try and bring out during the course of this presentation is some of the common factors that we see amongst organizations that are doing cloud well and really getting the most out of it. So I'll talk a little bit about the theory. The benefits are obvious. By giving responsibility for operations to the people who write our code, we get a much better experience. We allow problems to quickly end up with the people best placed to fix them. So obviously, you know, we've all got first line, second line, clearing huge amounts of our cases, doing a fantastic job. But that's not necessarily what we're talking about here. We're talking about the 10, 15% of problems that require code to fix. So genuine bugs, feature requests, this kind of thing. Now, these problems are only ever going to be solved by a developer. They require code changes. So the best thing we can do is get those problems to developers as quickly as possible. And as a result of that, we get these problems fixed as quickly as possible. So we're more agile. We hope we get better code. Our developers are closer to the, the live environment, to the operational environment. So they have a better understanding of what the pain points are, what the priorities should be. So we can prioritize where we're putting our effort much more effectively. And as a result, we hope that our code improves. As a result of our improved code, we hope for better reliability or improved reliability. Again, because we're focusing our effort in the right places, we understand where the pain points are and what we can do about them. You know, people are closer to the code. Now, we're moving faster. We've got better code. We're having less outages. We would hope all of these things lead to reduced costs. You know, we're more efficient at what we're doing, and we're spending less time fixing issues. And all of the above, the aim of all of this is to remove business risk and remove risk around these services and make them easier to maintain. So that's the theory. The practice can be somewhat trickier. As humans, we're naturally resistant to change. And these sort of changes can involve changes in things that we don't really like to talk about a lot of the time. Money, shifts, ways of working. You know, these are all quite difficult conversations to have. And we need to ensure that we're not shying away from these things, that we're being transparent about what we're doing. You know, this is a change. And in order for the introduction of DevOps and any kind of cultural change to be successful, our organizations need to be brought into that change. And in order for our organizations to be brought into the change, the individuals within our organization need to be brought into that, those changes as well. So this is a very important thing to, to remember. For some people, it can seem quite daunting to be given that level of responsibility. You know, this is a new thing, it's quite unusual. We need to ensure that our technical teams are aware that this brings benefits for them as well, as well as responsibilities. It's very important to make sure we get that message across, that we are ambassadors for that. The other thing that we see quite a lot is people trying to introduce agile DevOps culture through lists of processes or a document that says we're now doing DevOps. Now, Frankly, uh, whilst you, know, you can do things that way, it's very much not the best way to achieve these kind of changes. Small incremental changes in terms of doing this are very powerful. And as I said earlier, how we act and the behaviors we show are also extremely powerful in terms of bringing people along with us, which is really you know, what we need to be doing here. It's important to remember that when we're talking about introducing agile practice, we can make that introduction in an agile manner. We should think about changing the culture in the same way as we think about changing our services or changing our architecture. Small incremental changes to get to an end goal are, are very, very important. And really, from what I've seen, that's much more effective than trying to do a big bang approach you know, and, and enforce this in a top-down way. So we need to act as examples and show that we can walk the walk. 
And to stick on that theme, uh, we're going to hear from some of our customers now and some of their stories about the challenges they've faced in terms of making these changes and how they've overcome them. So uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Robin and Maria from Fangio. One, two, three. One, two, three. Hi, sorry, we don't have any radio mics, uh, so I've got to stay in this area here. That's about sweet spot right there. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Robin. I'm the CTO of Fangio. We've been cloud-based pretty much since we started, and we actually have an amazing DevOps team who manage hundreds of instances we use a variety of uh, the Amazon managed services to process literally thousands of uh, transactions per second. Myself and Maria, our head of HR, are here to tell you a slightly different story today about the cultural challenges that we've experienced from startup until now. So first of all, I'm going to take you back to 2007. Two Welshmen, an Englishman, a Scotswoman, and an Irishman walked into a pub in Edinburgh and a company called Hubdub was launched. Hubdub was a highly innovative news prediction game. And while the company was founded in Scotland, it actually found its audience in America. The most popular category proved to be sports, and ultimately Hubdub pivoted to FanDuel in 2009 with an ambition to disrupt the traditional fantasy sports industry. Now, you may have played fantasy football in the UK, where you draft your own fantasy team at the beginning of the season from real players, across the league, and then the fancy, your fantasy players score points based on the real life players' performances. But FanDuel wasn't just a disruptive startup, however. It actually created an entirely new industry called Daily Fantasy Sports, or DFS for short. America has over 50 million fantasy sports players, so as you can ima imagine, Americans went mad for it. The fantasy sports industry had seen no real innovation in 50 years. So FanDuel introduced one-day and weekly game options with a variety of entry fees and real money prizes. Games ranged in size from two players to thousands of players. And so rather than be stuck with your team for an entire season, you could pick a new lineup every day or every week with opportunities to win cash or just for bragging rights with your friends. The key ingredient in all disruptive startups is a founding team that has vision, focus, huge amounts of energy and a determination to win. The five founders of Fangio had this in spades. They inspired the same in the employees they hired. They were focused only on success, and then as a result, the winning culture was created. Now, let's be clear. At first, we would be lying if we said there was a completely developed strategy beyond let's do our best, build a product people love, and rule the world. But the positive energy and get stuff done mindset was working and product market fit was found immediately. So every new feature built just meant more users on the platform, which in turn brought more energy into the office and inevitably more money from VCs, which is always nice. We've always been keen on emulating the Silicon Valley style feel, both in the UK and the US. Our offices feature all the trimmings you'd expect, like a lavish kitchen with amazing facilities such as free drinks and uh, free snacks and plenty of space to chill out and spend time with your friends. You know, the idea being that we want you to spend time in the office and reinforce the mindset that we're all in this together and we will rule the world. Over time, a few similar companies started to spring up, but only one really stood out from the crowd. In 2012, a company called DraftKings literally exploded onto the scene. Fangio finally had a worthy competitor and everything was about to change. DraftKings followed our blueprint and very quickly created an almost identical product to ours. After all, it's always much easier and quicker to copy than to innovate. So for those of you building a disruptive startup, be warned. For several years, we cleaned up at award ceremonies and grew ex exponentially. We now had a solid strategy around making our platform more social. We started to change the way that we worked, evolving towards full stack delivery teams made up of product, engineering, design, and marketing. But while the world still loved Fangio, and we had a structure and processes that should have been enviable, the internal culture had begun to crack in two distinct ways. Firstly, with rapid growth and rapid hiring, 
As we rapidly grow our employee headcount from just 30 to over 400 in just a couple of years, we hadn't had the time to articulate our culture and our values, and so our DNA was being diluted as people started to interpret the culture in their own way. Secondly, we'd started to lose focus on being customer-obsessed, and we'd become competitor-obsessed. Ultimately, this led to innovation slowing down, which unwittingly started to disengage the employees we'd hired who loved to innovate. So in 2015, we faced some really difficult regulatory challenges. The New York Attorney General stated that daily fantasy sports websites were unregulated gambling, and he banned the operations in New York, which was a massive blow to us. Up to this point, we had been hiring and retaining employees on the basis of them having a really bright future with us. But now at this point, every single day, there was news coming in of more states banning us. So it was a really, really uncertain time for us, all of us. However, some other states took a more positive approach and they said, hey, like, why don't you regulate the industry? So we really, really liked that idea. And we spent the next few months working on compliance and working on regulatory requirements. So that took time. But gradually, the states that had banned us started to repeal those bans, including New York. So this was a massive win for us, a massive win for Fangio um, and Daily Fantasy Sports. However, during this period of turbulence, we really experienced a lot of negative publicity. And that impacted us on our growth, but it impacted the trust that our customers had put in us and the trust that our employees had put in us as well. So to try and recover quickly, we started merger talks with our main competitor, DraftKings, which Robin has mentioned. For nine months, we spoke to them. And it was weird, because for the last few years, we had been competitors, and I'd go as far as to say maybe even sworn enemies. But yet now, we were talking about maybe getting married. We were like talking to each other. We were sharing information. Long story short, merger didn't go ahead, and we went our separate ways. So Fangio took this opportunity to press the reset button, we paused and we kind of took a long, hard look. We listened to our employees and we listened to our customers. So at the end of 2017, one of the first things that we did was we aligned our culture and our strategy with the, the emphasis on innovation. Within a matter of weeks, we launched two games that were free for our customers to play. And we saw an immediate benefit with this, with a huge amount of new customers coming to our site. And actually, it goes far as to say the innovation that we've done since the start of this year is probably more than we did in the last couple of years. And we've got a fantastic pro product roadmap ahead of us. And we put that down to the fact that we've now created a clear vision. It's customer focused. And we've created a set of values that are around our customer obsession. So we're back in growth mode, which is brilliant. And we've got a huge hiring plan for this year. And it all centers around our culture and around our values. We're training our employees and ensuring that they can assess for our culture at our recruitment stage. And we went back to the drawing board and we really reconfigured how the key relationships between product, engineering, marketing, and design work. So all of these different functions have got different stakeholders, but they've all got one unified goal, and that is to make sports more exciting is to make a product that our customer absolutely loves. So with mutual trust and real empathy around each other's goals, we're really moving forward together. And we've changed the way that we communicate with each other as well. We're really instilling in our leadership the importance to lead, to really provide a mission and objectives. Like, what are we doing? What is it we need to do? How are we going to get there? These are all things that our employees are looking for. And we actually, we meet monthly with our, um, we have like a company huddle where our CEO brings us together and he talks to us about, okay, this is where our vision is, this is where our objectives are, and this is how we're performing against them. And we use that call to talk about examples of where employees have shown those, those values, where they've gone above and beyond, where they've demonstrated meeting and exceeding our customer expectations. So I guess any cultural shift takes time, and something I'm personally really passionate about within Fangio is that we create a diverse and inclusive culture, one where everybody can bring them whole, their whole selves to work. So it doesn't matter what walk of life they're from, but any sort of um, communication is really important, the fact that we talk to each other, and at the heart of everything is that we trust and we respect each other. So in closing, the lessons we learned were, firstly, 
define authentic values as early as possible and higher to your values. Secondly, be obsessed with your customers. Build a product that people love and they will choose you. Thirdly, be inspired by the innovations of your competitors, but keep true to your own product vision and only adopt their ideas if they really do complement your own. And finally, and perhaps most importantly of all, company strategy and culture need to be aligned every step of the way. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I hope you all found that interesting. So just to sort of compare and contrast with this, uh, we're going to hear from another organization now with a, a very, from a very different area of industry. Uh, I'd like to welcome Kay Church from the Met Office. So hi, I'm Kay Church. I'm based in the, the Met Office, which is down in Exeter in Devon. A lovely place, I can recommend it if you feel like a change. So I love AWS technology, but what I found is it's the people that really make a difference. So today I'd like to share with you some of our experiences on our cloud adoption journey. But first I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Met Office. So our purpose is to work at the forefront of weather and climate science. We issue weather warnings to keep people safe and work with our other government agencies. Prosperity, this is about creating economic growth. Weather really matters to people and getting the right weather data and information out to industries is really important. It matters to aviation, it matters to defense, it really matters to retail and other organizations. And well-being. By having the right weather forecast, you can enjoy your day. Take advantage of the sunshine or remember to bring your umbrella. So at the Med Office, we work at scale. We output about 200 terabytes per day from our climate and our operational models. And we do more calculations in one day than the global finance industry does in an entire year. So our changes haven't happened overnight. There have been a series of step changes along the way. So back, to, uh, back in 2012, we started to experiment with agile working practices. And by 2015, we'd adopted the Spotify tribes and squads models. And what we found was, by having really consistent teams working together, we were really able to improve productivity, the quality of our work, and also help balance our resourcing. We also introduced an innovation lab, which was a mix of technology staff and science. And we freed up these people to really experiment with new technologies. That culture of experimentation really spread to our development teams, who have been working at the forefront of using some of the real cutting edge AWS technologies. In 2016, we put our first production workload live to support our website and our mobile app. And we also um, started working with a third party organization called CloudReach to really help accelerate our cloud journey. And one of the lessons I've really learned is it's really important to find organizations to work with that have the same consistent culture as your own. CloudReach have been fantastic help in our journey and really accelerated that for us. In 2017, we put in a dedicated link uh, to AWS to enable us to share our APIs and make our data more accessible to people. We've also been doing a lot more work with serverless. And we've been working with the AWS IoT teams to improve our observations network. 
One of our real challenges has been the excitement that our development teams have felt using these new technologies. And that's been a real contrast to our infrastructure and operations uh, side of the business, who have a real depth of expertise in running our data centers and running our supercomputer. These guys have felt quite nervous about some of the changes. So our executive leaders have really helped drive and, and make a clear strategy so that everybody was clear within the organization about where our direction was heading. We've also invested quite a lot in terms of training and communications. So these changes have taken time. This is what we're working on at the moment. So our focus is really on our people. We're using guilds to share information between the different teams creating study groups so individuals can share experiences. We're focusing on governance right across the organization from the executive level and across the different business areas. In operations and platforms, we're creating reusable templates and patterns for our development teams to use. And we're continuing to engage with the rest of the organization by creating events that engage uh, the wider business. Yeah, well, thank you for that, Kate. Um, I hope, again, you can see some of the uh, uh, contrasts and, and comparisons between those, those, those two stories, and also some of the common themes that are coming out. Um, and what I want to do now is just run through some key tenets, really, around not how you can introduce this, but how you can think about introducing it. There's no one path to doing this, but I found that these are very useful things to think about when you're working out what your strategy is going to be uh, for how you want to introduce these kinds of changes. So DevOps is about people. To a large degree, we, we can't force or proceduralize the changes that we want to make. But what we can do is work to ensure that the right conditions exist within our organizations for the behaviors that we're after to emerge. And some of the things that we found very helpful here are really focusing on the service you're trying to deliver and making sure that everyone understands that that is the focus. Demonstrating a willingness to change business process as well as technical process. Working with all the touch points across the business to streamline your handovers and ensure that everyone involved understands your aims and what you're trying to do. And most importantly, probably, creating a safe environment in which to experiment. This is absolutely vital. And if you're really experimenting, if you're pushing yourself hard enough, most of your experiments should fail. And those are all lessons that you can learn from. But don't take that failure as discouragement. These are, these are vital lessons that we need to learn. And I mean, there's some, there's some technical actions we can take here too. Make sure all of your services are in cloud formation and all your, your environments are built in cloud formation. And this way, we can experiment cheaply and safely. We can build up test environments very quickly and tear them down again. And again, what that does is gives your, your staff freedom to go off and, and experiment with these services and do creative things with them. Also, we can use techniques like blue-green deployments to keep our production environments agile and again, allow that experimentation and testing that, that we need in order to make these changes. And also, the techniques that we apply to our technical environments, we can apply to cultural change as well. We can be agile about introducing cultural change. And of course, the phrase everything fails all of the time, that applies to culture as well. So again, don't be discouraged if things go wrong. And again, I think Robin's got some examples of some ways that they've worked to, to create these conditions. Yeah, so a few years ago, we had um, some issues around our dev environments, which we call dev stacks. Um, and one of the, the common conversations I used to have with Steve, our director of infrastructure, was around the pain that engineers were feeling around how long it took to spin up a new dev stack. Um, and when it, when, it, when it spun up, they then had to figure out how to load the right data that they needed in to develop the use case they were working on. And it was just a constant grind. And this just became a constant conversation between myself and Steve and myself and various other engineers. And so and we tried to solve it in a number of different ways. But ultimately, we came up with the idea 
uh, I give credit to my team, it wasn't my idea, it was actually their idea, um, to come up with these sort of ephemeral dev stacks that, that Steve actually named mini fanduals. And the idea here was that you could spin up uh, your own entire FanDuel platform with all the microservices that you needed and with all the data that you needed to develop your particular thing, literally at the push of a button. And then in a hackathon, we actually took it to the next stage. Uh, one of the DevOps engineers took it to the next stage, which was uh, to m make them automatically shut down overnight to save money. And so with a combination of these two things, we're now actually able to empower engineers to spin up their own dev stack uh, very cheaply and cost efficiently, literally in about 10 or 20 minutes, loaded with the data that they would need, uh, ob obfuscated obviously, just to make sure any from, anyone from GDPR is listening, uh, that, uh, um, so they could actually get on and, and start developing really, really quickly. Now this didn't just benefit uh, engineers and, and, and DevOps, and by the way, I can't actually remember the last time I had a conversation with anyone about uh, complaining about dev stack. So well done, Steve and, and team, for, for getting it so well done. But it actually benefits stakeholders across the business because now we're actually able to be much more reactive to some last minute changes that come through rather than saying, oh, do you know what? We haven't got a stack that's in a state to be able to accommodate that change or whatever. We can't even begin looking at it. We can go, yep, yeah, we can have a quick look at that. Um, and so that has really now improved uh, overall collaboration across the company and, and trust across the company. It was a fundamental change. And what we did to achieve that was just take a step back and say, hang on a sec, guys. The most important thing we can do now is to take a step back, figure out this problem, and then we'll be able to move faster. So that leads in quite neatly to the, the next point I wanted to make. We need to educate across our organizations. So we need to think about training opportunities in a, in a holistic way and not just concentrate on the, the technical training opportunities we've got. So often we'll find that our new agile processes, where we can do everything very, very quickly, will bump up against organizational obstacles once they leave the technology teams. So you know, they might bump into a, a, a sign off from finance, for example. You know, these teams have their own processes and procedures that need to be adhered to. And the way we deal with that, what we, what we need to do in order to work around those things, is we need to preempt that. And the way we do that is by educating these teams and letting them understand what cloud is, how it works, what it does. So, I mean, AWS runs courses this. We run AWS Business Essentials, which is a great course for non-technical teams to give an understanding of, of what cloud is and what it does. And what this means is that when we really do need to move fast, when we need these people's help, they're going to be a lot more understanding of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve. So again, make sure that you're spreading this knowledge and this training across your organization and not just concentrating on tech. And again, I think Kay's got an example of the way they've done this in, in the Met Office. So one of the things we've done in the Met Office is create a digital academy to help us uh, share some of the information and also to create conversations. So we've invited guest speakers. It started off quite small. But it's really grown into something that's been really successful and created a great conversation with people outside of technology and the rest of the business about what we're doing. And again, this kind of follows on from the last point, really. Uh, we need to live and breathe collaboration. Organizational culture is all about people. And people love silos. We all feel most comfortable working with those we work with every day, the people we know, the people we usually interact with. But being the individual who can break out of that and really work across teams is, is a hugely powerful place to be. So silos are endemic in most organizations between departments, between teams, sometimes between people sat at the same desk. And when you're trying to break down these silos, the importance of bringing silo teams together really can't be overstated. Take advantage of every opportunity for, for cross-team working. Set up face-to-face -face meetings. Get people in the same room together. And we've done this in some areas with teams on different continents. And the results of you know, a two or three hour face-to-face -face meeting can be really dramatic. So we've had problems that have hung around for months, years, where teams have never met. And getting them in a room together really, really can, can make progress uh, and, and build those bridges. And again, I think Robin's got another example of how they've done some of this stuff at Fangio. Yeah, so again, coming back to one of the points I made in my, my talk earlier on, back in 
2015, um, when we started to change, one of the things that we had was we had sort of the product and marketing guys over in the US, which is where our market is, obviously. And our engineering team is largely in the UK, in, in Edinburgh and Glasgow. And uh, to, to be kind of blunt, I suppose, it was a, a bit like a client vendor relationship with requirements coming in and us doing the work and then giving it back and back and forth, you know, you know the kind of setup. And there was this perception that engineering was kind of inefficient and slow to deliver and, and this kind of stuff. And we were like, but everyone's working really hard. So what's the problem? And so what we did was we got everyone in a room uh, over a two-day workshop, and we actually worked through what all the problems were. And what we found was there was an awful lot of time being burnt in research and analysis and trying to build confidence in that what we were going to build was going to be successful before we'd even put pen to paper. Um, now, this might, might be a familiar story for, for some of you guys. So what we did, uh, there was a couple of things that we did. First of all, we started to evolve towards sort of full-stack teams, a bit like Kay described with the Spotify model, where we actually had cross-functional uh, people within the, the teams from product, marketing, design, even finance in certain cases, customer services, all being part of the, the same team. They were all accountable for the delivery. And, and we also introduced the, the minimum viable product uh, and iterate mindset as well. And with everyone feeling accountable and feeling part of a team and a sort of self-contained business unit, what we actually found was even with the geographical d divide, uh, everyone started to collaborate an awful lot more because they were all equally responsible for the outcome. And immediately, we started to move a lot faster. There was less time in research. There was more conversation, less time going out and talking to customers, things like this. Now, as Gavin said earlier on with, uh, in the keynote about the companies that change most successfully, they're the ones that iterate. We didn't get this perfect on day one, right? This took probably at least a year before we actually got it to a place that we'd say was really good. Um, but we were determined that we had the right model going forward, having these full stack cross-functional teams and the MVP approach, let's operate more based on your gut rather than going out and doing weeks and weeks and weeks of research. And what we found uh, that once we actually got it to a good place, our delivery throughput more than doubled. And that is why, coming back to what Maria said earlier on, once we actually got back to an innovative uh, space, we were able to actually, we've, we, we've delivered more things in the first five months of 2018 than we did in the whole of 2017. And in 2017, we delivered twice as much stuff as we did in 2016. So that just shows you the power of collaboration. So this is probably the, uh, one of the trickier ones to manage on here. Embrace your critics. So whenever you go into an organization with the aim of, of introducing cultural change, you're always going to get variable levels of enthusiasm from different individuals within that organization. And it's important to remember that your most vocal detractors can be some of your biggest allies. Some of the reasons these people are being vocally critical is because they have issues that they're passionate about. And what these people are doing are signposting you towards problems that you can resolve. So they're incredibly useful to you. So lavish your time and attention on these people. Embrace them. Bring them in and listen to their concerns. Because if you can resolve those problems, a lot of the time your most vocal critics will become your biggest advocates. And having these people on your side is, a, again, a fantastic place to be in terms of spreading the word about how we're going to be working and how we're going to be doing things. And again, Kay, I think you've got a... So recently we uh, ran a team brief. It's something we do on a regular basis within the Met Office. And um, we asked the teams and squads to come up with a retrospective of the year, but we asked them to do it in an innovative way. So we said, make a film or do a skit or do a quiz. And as you can imagine, uh, some people thought this was a really bad idea. But when it came to the day, it was fantastic. People had loads of fun making the, uh, making the videos, making the films. And it was brilliant to see all of the progress that had been made in the different teams over the year. And at the end of that day, we had some of the people who had actually been really critical of the idea posting on our internal social media saying it was a brilliant day. So sometimes I think you need to embrace people, get people involved, and then you'll end up with the right result in the end. OK, so I've got the, the last two points I'm going to make now. And I think these are probably the most important points out of these. The purpose 
of all this collaboration and education and working across our organization. Really, what it's for is we want to build trust within our organizations. When you've got trust between teams, really, a lot of the hard work of any cultural change is done. Although, if you can find me an organization where every team trusts every other team 100%, I'd be very surprised. But having that trust is absolutely key. So one of the things that can happen when you're trying to introduce these kind of cultural changes is, again, and this is something we see quite a lot with a big bang approach, is people will get defensive about it. People will put up barriers to it. And of course, that's the exact opposite of what we're trying to do. We're trying to remove these barriers. So again, coming back to doing these things in an incremental fashion, small changes, really helps to get that trust that the changes we're making are going to benefit everybody. Now, when we've got that trust, what it allows us to do is delegate authority because different bits of our organization will trust that other teams are going to do the right thing about the areas that they care about. Now, if we can delegate authority, that means we can remove a lot of process, a lot of approval, a lot of sign-off, a lot of waiting. So again, having that trust in your organization there is absolutely key. And again, there's some technical things we can do here. So things like AWS Config, for example, allows you to configure your environment such that the people working in it will understand that the services that they can use are approved. They're the ones they're allowed to use. There's a phrase that I've, I've heard a bit recently, which I really love, which says, guardrails, not gates. Sign off and approval is a gate. We stop there. And we have to wait for someone to come and open it for us. Guardrails, we can go as fast as we like, and we're not going to come off the track. And that's really what we're trying to do here. We're trying to put things in place such that we can just go and do things and not have to worry about whether what we're doing is the correct thing to do. So yeah, that building of organizational trust is absolutely key. And that phrase, guardrails, not gates, is a really good thing to think about when you're trying to make decisions around how you're going to do this kind of work. And finally, once I get my slides to change, I've made this point a few times, and I just want to come back to it as the last point of this presentation. Incremental change is incredibly powerful. The most successful cultural changes we've seen have happened over a period of time and have been accomplished by a series of small changes that in and of themselves don't necessarily seem that significant. But by avoiding that big bang approach, we remove the shock factor, we reduce defensiveness, and we allow organizational trust to build. Now, as someone who's spent a career in operations, I found that working this way has made my life in ops much better. Once people begin to see that, you'll start to get a bit of a snowball effect. And when you start seeing that snowball effect, that's when you know you've been successful in what you're trying to do. So that's all I wanted to say today. I hope you've enjoyed the session. Uh, I'd like to thank our guests, Met Office and uh, FanDuel, for their insights. Uh, I've also got a quick plug for a Met Office and uh, TFL hackathon that's going to be happening. I'll leave a slide up on the end. So if any of you are interested in that, there's uh, some great access to some data you wouldn't normally get access to. So uh, I'll leave that on for some details. Uh, please give us a rating on the mobile app. And uh, thank you very much.